So I finally remembered to record this. Um, you guys are supposed to remind me. <laughs> All right, so, so we're gonna, I'll summarize or I'll just try to recall in your mind what this article was talking about. And then we'll call on each person to give an example. And I think it's nice that we're recording this because if each of us gives an example, all of a sudden we've got this huge picture in our minds of all the different levels of ways that women get exploited in the marketplace, right? Um, and that'll help you, I think, kind of be a lot more savvy as consumers. Don't let yourself get sucked into stuff. If your parents or maybe boyfriend or relatives start mimicking this stuff, just call them out, you know, just say, wait a sec, that's just the way people make money off of women. Don't, you know, don't go there. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is that inequality, you know, in the US, there's just a lot of women who think inequality is not a problem anymore, which is just ridiculous. And then there are a lot of women that voted for Trump and they don't care about his sexual behavior and his machismo behavior. And they even sort of like it. So we've had this huge backlash and backward movement. Um, and so I suppose that's a cautionary tale for those of you in developing countries that you really are starting in a different place. But, you know, every step forward, there's the possibility of a half step backwards. And um, I hope that you, because you are, you didn't come from privilege, but once you get educated, you are privileged that you will not use your privilege <clears throat> to tell other women, you know, no problem, just work hard, you know, <laughs> to ignore. I don't think any of you will, but it is sad for me because people I know, people, you know, my friends in philosophy, for example, they, can, they really don't speak out. Uh, about injustices. They get very caught up in their professional lives. And it's sad because if you don't speak out, it gets worse. There's just always this patriarchal push on things. And if you don't keep pushing back, it will continue. Um, so women make less money and then their products, women spend about $2,000 more not because they're so materialistic, but because partly because the products they need are overpriced, partly to satisfy men who tell them, you know, you need a better haircut or you need blah, blah, but not, you know, to, to assume that's just because all women care about is they like to go shopping, blah, blah. It's not true. Um, so, there's something, I mean, I hadn't ever thought about this before, but our pants don't have pockets, right? Or when they're small, then women have to buy purses. And of course, pur purses, at least in the US, become this huge status symbol. People will pay hundreds of dollars for the right brand of purse, which is just ridiculous. It has nothing to do with the function, like why do you need one in the first place? Because your pants don't have any pockets. Oh my gosh. <laughs> then the other thing was children's toys, which I think is really important. And it gets kids started from an early age, dividing kids, right? Boys are tough and girls like dolls. And I can say I have grandkids and I go into, I hate to admit it, but in the town I used to live in, that was the only place to go was Walmart, okay, sorry. <laughs> but I would go there and my gosh, every toy was gendered. I can't think of a toy that was not gendered. 
So I went to the artworks part and I bought my grandkids construction paper and, you know, crayons and magic markers. That was not gendered, but it really is awful and it's really scary because the boy toys are very violent a lot of times. They're not just kind of tough guy police officer. They're like violent. The guy who goes and gets the bad guys. And then the girl toys aren't just nurturing. They're, oh, the little princess or, oh, really passive, really um, extreme. I, you know, it's a shock to me because 50 years ago, I knew about the feminist movement was on the rise. And I never got into that stuff in the first place. I had a friend who loved Barbies. And whenever I went to her house to play, she was not my good friend. We always had to play Barbie and Ken. And she had this huge, her dad was a psychiatrist, so she had a lot of money. And she had this huge, like three-story Barbie house and all these Barbie cars and everything. Oh, geez. <laughs> I did not like it, but it's very gendered and um, it sets kids up the rest of their life for not being able to get along, for couples not actually being friends with each other because they're, you know, they're divided psychologically and in their roles from a young age. And then um, they're also in my country anyway, and, and I think it might happen, it might already have happened in your country, is this nostalgia for the roles of the older generation. So I do want to um, mention this because I'm sure that at various times in your life, really, more than one time, there would probably be a dozen times where you will think, oh, can't, I just want to go back to the good old days. It was simpler. This is way too complicated. And I just want to tell you that, that I had a way, way more complicated life than my mother. And my mother had a more complicated life than her mother. But even though I knew, I, I did think about my mother. I thought about, well, her marriage, her relation to her kids her relation to her work, her leisure time. You know, I went through all the seven goddesses sort of with my mother and me. And I just had to have a more complicated life. And the highs are higher and the lows are lower. And it's just like, oh. So um, I just want to warn you about that. And even though, you know, it was more complicated and I had problems my mother didn't have, I never thought that I would have wanted to trade it for a simpler life. But there are going to be a lot of people who do. And you will have periods in your life, I think, when it's just too much and you want to go back and not have such a complicated life. But I think if you persist, um, I know in my case, the only thing that could get me going was that I kept thinking, this is what I think I can do for the world, to make the world a better place, to make it better for my kids. And so it wasn't really about me and my ego. It was really about what do I think I have the most to offer? And if I quit, I'm not, the world isn't going to get what I think I have to offer. Now, when I was teaching, uh, in Arkansas, there weren't a lot of kids that really wanted what I had to offer, but again, that's okay. I still kept thinking, but it's still important, even if nobody wants it. Um, anyway, so there's this problem of nostalgia. Then there's this, this issue of you have two separate product lines, entire product lines. Well, and that makes money, right? You make more money that way. Then cartoons um get one got shut down because they were intended to be marketed for boys but had a lot of girl followers i don't know why he shut it down but um there are shows that appeal to people based on gen gender um let's see um all right 
yeah, okay. There's that also the thing about that talking about menstruation is such a, a stigma, even in the US, okay, because we have a very puritanical background. My parents were not that way, but boy, a lot of people are. And so if men don't like to talk about that stuff, then women still have to purchase it and it gets overpriced and then they get blamed for spending too much money, right? They, because just having a reasonable conversation with your husband about here's how much money those pads actually cost every month, please. If you can buy cheaper, if you can tell me where to get cheaper ones. But I mean, unless you have that conversation, there's a chunk of money that gets spent that you get blamed for, right? And you know, that's gotta, that's gotta go. Um, and so her solution as usual is to raise awareness, to uh, expose ignorance, which is the whole liberal arts thing, right? Why do you take liberal arts classes? To raise awareness, right? All of your liberal arts teachers their, that's their mission, really, is to raise your awareness, to expose ignorance, so that when you go into the world, you're more aware, and you will call out ignorance in other people. Um, there's also electing officials that care more about equality. Of course, in the U.S. and many places in the world, we're going backwards in that. But again, that tends to be in the developed developed countries in France and all in these places. But I don't know what's happening in the developing countries. I, my, my hunch is that because women's education is so important for developing, it probably is uh, not as bad. In the sexism is still worse, but the attitudes, right, are maybe shifting right? The way politicians can uh, get traction from valuing women's education, where in the U.S. women assume equality of education. Politicians actually get traction or they get ignored for their sex life and their abuses of women because something else matters more to these women. Um, all right, so um, all right, and so her conclusion is that you shouldn't pressure children with stereotypical ideas, and a lot of you have already talked quite a bit about that, and I like AUW students because they are those girls that <laughs> got out of the box, um, and you should live how you feel rather than feel um, what you should, who, uh, rather than who you feel you should, uh, you should be, right? Live how you feel you want to be rather than feel you should be according to somebody else's standards. And so what we need, right, is a change to the economic structure, a wider acceptance of uh, feminist values and more public awareness. So it's another example of a good paper, a good student paper. She identifies the problems, she gets specific, and then she makes recommendations for the future, right? And so this paper adds to the body of knowledge because people didn't necessarily know any of that stuff before, or if they knew it, they never put it together to, to give a broader picture of what's going on. So that's what I'm looking for in your research papers also. So now we'll go around this, the circle or the square, whatever you wanna call it. And each, each student can give an example of some product and then which, you know, what, what aspect of sexism does that product appeal to? Um, okay, Bristi, do you wanna start? All right, uh, Mahira. Yes, ma'am. Uh, in Asian countries, like in Bangladesh, 
the girl, everyone's um, skin tone is quite like brown. Uh, so uh, uh, it is expected that girls need to be fair. Fair is beautiful. So that's why there is a product in our country called Gori. Yeah, uh, that product is overpriced. Uh, and it's, um, it's like a small, like small, small product which finishes very easily. Uh, it's, so women buys them more often, more and more, which basically fares and glows your skin tones. Um, like, uh, like everyone wants fair skin. Yeah, that is uh, in our country. I hope not everybody used that example because <laughs> it's, now I've heard it many times. The first time a student told me, I was just shocked. And I think I did say that in class, like I envy you, your skin, white skin is crappy skin. Um, so it's very ironic, but I hope everybody who had that example needs to think about another example. <laughs> uh, and you know, I never think about my students in terms of their skin tone. And I'm thinking, is this, am I gonna start thinking this way just because, you know, they think, you know, I was just like, oh no, no. I don't, you know what I mean? It's just never even occurred to me. Um, so I hope that that doesn't yes, start. Like students are bullied, girls are bullied in our country for not being fair. Like I'm also bullied in my school times many, many times. Well, another thing that I find really sad and disappointing is that my country was the country of immigrants, right? And now we're, if the immigrants aren't white skinned, somehow that's different and it's terrible. But my daughter-in-law is from Mexico. I don't know if I told you this, but when her kids were born, each time she said I was relieved because the kid had light skin. And so they could pass as being completely American, whatever the heck that is. And I just find that so incredibly sad. Like, so people aren't going to look at my grandkids and think, oh, that kid is part Mexican, you know? No, she's, and she, and the thing is, she has a reason as a mom to be happy because who knows, you know, they might start having prejudice against. I mean, it's just so stupid. Skin color, <laughs> haven't we grown out of that? I guess not. It's really getting used as a political tool and then as a personal tool, right? It's terrible. It's being used as a weapon in every aspect of life. And that is incredibly sad. Um, but for capitalism and a free market, whatever sells, you know, that's People, the, the salespeople say that, well, there's a hunger for this. There's a demand. There's nothing we can do. Like, we just have to meet the demand. And then they're the ones that run the ads that create the demand. And then they say, well, oh, we're just meeting the demands. And then, oh, eh. okay. So, Jacinta, what do you have? All right. Janifa. I don't know. Uh, please, in the chat, tell me that you're here. If you're not here, you know, it's an absence. You can't just turn on your machine and go do something. So, Risti, Jacinta, and Janifa need to put in the chat if they're here and there's some microphone problem, okay? Fayaza. Uh, yes, Professor, I have to share one uh, thought because yesterday I watched one documentary film regarding the child marriage. So like uh, that is um, the girl, uh, she's uh, forced to marry uh, in Sahara, they, they said. So that is the documentary. And uh, in desert, uh, she's forcing to marry uh, in very young age, it is uh, 11 years old. Uh, uh, because of the marriage, she has to be a fat. Be, uh, so, so for that, uh, they are going to the desert and they are uh, making the hut and all. 
so i think nine 19 calories or some something i forget uh they have to eat uh, i mean uh, it's more than 20 burger calories they have to eat the whole, uh for the one meal so they will be get fed and they can marry <laughs> like so they are giving uh, many factors for that uh, when she, uh, the women are like uh, giving the some drugs for the children to become a fed and like uh, there are many vitamins and all but it is illegal they can't uh, buy uh, from the uh, market uh, they are uh, illegally they are buying that uh, drugs and they are giving to the child and when uh, when uh, the documentary uh, that girl was asking to the child you really like to become a fat uh, but she said like uh, I, uh, yes because uh, th- like their mentality is like that they say uh, yes i have to become a fat because uh, i will be pretty then i can marry a guy like uh, because the whole the desert uh, women are the thoughts are like that so the girl is uh, showing that pictures uh, about the modeling other stuff and they saying yes yeah, she is pretty but uh, her look uh, her face is pretty but she is not fat so she is not uh, that much like you know they are j- just uh, get, uh, getting fat is the one of the main causes of the marriage uh, like i was watched that I, i will i will share with you ma'am after that very good fayasa i remember hearing about that that um, yeah. um women in my country being thin is the status because we can eat all the time and in countries where women can't eat then being fat is status um marzia uh, yes professor i want to uh, add something in fayaza's uh, voice i have also watched this documentary yeah this is like uh, i think this is about the beauty standards in different marzia countries. It's a little muted. Do you think you can make it clearer? Professor, now can you hear me? A little better. Talk okay. talk uh, loud and slow. Now okay. is it okay? Is it okay now? Yeah, it's better. Okay. Uh I think uh this documentary is about the beauty standards for women in different countries. uh like uh, in some countries if women are fair it's she is a beautiful woman with long hair for example uh with high uh, head but on that documentary i think it's from uh in some parts of african continent but arabic uh, countries that that child they are really baby like they are not in the ma- in a marriage age but the parents are thinking about how to take you know how to feed them to get fatter and then they marry soon and then when the, uh, they ask the reason she says that because when uh, when a, a child is uh, fat then she looks older on that time we can marry them sooner so i i think that it's uh, like uh, why you know, what is what is wondering me that why this happens to girls it's not only in one country it's in all c- countries but in different ways uh in some countries that uh, like the girls the girls had to buy some products to make them themselves beautiful why why they should do that and i don't know the the answer so yeah yeah professor okay. kanisha who's turn uh dolana did you have a related one then Uh, yes professor okay, okay. Uh, in our country like most of the time uh, uh, like in our society people wants to uh, marry the beautiful girl like the slim and thin girls like uh, when some uh, like when the some when some girls uh, like fat and like they didn't want to marry them like uh, they want to marry the thin and slim girls so the uh, like before uh, like um, <clears throat> marry they have to be slim like they have to lose their weight and uh, like they have to maintain diet chart and a lots of things 
like uh, it's a like um, it's a things uh, like uh, uh, in our society uh, they don't uh, um, in our society uh, people always look forward to like uh, uh, like <clears throat> the slim and beautiful girls and fair girls also uh, <laughs> so uh, uh, it's a discrimination like uh, uh, I don't know why they are uh, looking forward to the uh, slim and beautiful girl always like uh, like oh, oh like other uh, fat uh, girls what they will do like um, it it is not uh, like uh, it is not easy to like lose their weight uh, like uh, in uh, in other uh, class, uh, one of my friends said that, uh, uh, like, uh, she was so fat, and uh, she said that uh, all the people said that you have to marry, and you you are going to be uh, so fat, and you have to marry as soon as possible, because if you will not marry, then uh, you cannot give birth, and uh, no no man will <laughs> marry you like in in our society it is a like um, it is a rule like okay yeah i get it um so in my country yeah there's just an unnatural uh standard for being thin um because the trouble in my country is that food that makes you fat is cheaper and so if you're thin, it means that you have enough money to buy fresh vegetables and fresh fish and um, more expensive things. And so again, it's related to class. Um, and it's just, everything goes back to money, um, which is really sad. Um, I'm not against a free market. I'm, I don't think the government should run the whole economic sector, but the combination of regulations and also then people just need to be more thoughtful about how they live. Um, but anyway, good, Delana, that's good to know also. And of course the West sells you on that, right? We export this image of the fair skin skinny lady, and then we sell you all these products. Um, that try to help you get skinny, you know, and make a lot of money on that too. So it is pretty crazy. Um, let's see, let me pick up where I left off. You know, the squares are switching out a lot. So just rest assured that everybody will get a chance eventually. Um, Toma, have you got something? Yes, Professor. Uh, actually, in my con in our country, uh, like uh, the mostly um, women are mostly facing who are uh, their uh, face color or their body color is uh, black and uh, also brown. Uh, they are facing a lot of difficulties uh, regarding marriage or um, they are bullying in schools, colleges or any educational place or any job sectors because uh, the uh, boys are always admired to um, um, like the beautiful girls and this that's why they discriminate the girls uh, they judge girls their body colors or like this so in our country uh, i found a product which is uh, mostly uh, women uses for um, reduce these issues like uh, it's called lota herbal and uh, this product is mostly um, often used uh, like the women who uh, their um, uh, body color is black and uh, it's uh, also uh, its work and uh, their color they got uh, the white color and um, like this uh, it was really uh, one of the beautiful product which helped really women to 
reduce these problems. Well, does it have a bad health effect? I had a student write that it says it's it's got chemicals in it that yeah. get into your body and into your skin. Um, it's got a high yeah. carbon footprint in the making of it. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, it's just yes. bad in every way, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Professor. It has yeah. a high yeah. effect, I think. Yeah. But skin cancer? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, skin cancer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, because yeah. after, you know, but stopping... in, in our village, I saw. Okay. Uh, some of the women uh, who do, who use these products and got the profit. Huh. I so, think it not. Yeah, it's depend on the, like, uh, the health disease. It's depend on, because some women have allergic problems. So, who use these products, so she can face the difficulties but uh, who do but not Toma, have you know, health most, issues most like... of the time most of the time it was dangerous for skin and it causes yeah, yeah. Uh, I cancer heard. okay and... i have a question for toma do women business yes. business people sell it to women and make money yes professor okay so yeah it, is it mostly women that are selling it to women Yes. I'm not too men uh, like uh, yeah. It's available on the shop. Okay. Okay. I mean that's interesting and there's an old tradition of that. Um, yeah. um for example, you know Chinese foot binding. Um there's we're going to talk about how bo women's bodies are mutilated in a lot of ways to please men. And the Chinese foot binding, it's a woman who does the foot binding, right? And tells, you know, this woman, ah, now you're going to be beautiful and some guy will love you, right? And I'm going to hurt you so that some guy will love you. Uh, it's, yeah. Um, Professor. Okay, so why don't we let Breesty go? And I have to wait, Marzia, and make sure everybody gets a first chance. So... We're gonna still go with everybody's first chance, okay? So Breesty, go ahead. Uh, professor, I'm saying that I have seen that, uh, you know, as Thomas said that uh, about the product, uh, the products, you know, uh, you if you, uh, if you start use the product, you have to continue using this product regularly. I mean, if you stop to uh, use this, you know, then it, uh, it shows uh, its uh, side effects and your uh, face or skin will be the same as before. Okay. So it's not good. Yeah, yeah. it's not good. And, uh, start. It's like uh, smoking or something, you get addicted. Yeah, yes. It's work fast sleep. Um, I mean, very fast to become, you know, uh, to make the face or skin fair, but uh, it's not good. I mean, you you would have to do it your whole life. It's just you gotta yeah 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 better to stop at the beginning. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah. But okay. after, yeah, and another after thing. Wait, wait, doctor, wait, wait, wait Dolana, wait, Dolana. We have to make sure everybody gets a chance here. So, Pooja, <laughs> go ahead. I'm glad you're excited, Dolana. I really am. But you know, I've got to make sure everybody. Hello, gets professor. Go ahead, Pooja. Is my is my voice clear? Yes. Is, okay. So I think uh, uh, beauty standards, uh, particularly uh, if I'm talking to, about Nepal, plays an important role, especially for the uh, generations like my fa uh, my parents or my grandpas. So basically what happens is like, you know, uh, I recently visited my um, village for celebrating one of the festival and then there were a few of the grandpa grandmas especially ladies and aunties who were you know talking about the other children how they look or like how they behave or their skin tones and everything and i i really didn't like it and i i, I think it really you know hampers or uh, especially uh, 
uh, it affects the mental health especially and also you know demotivates uh, any of the uh, child uh, minds or like you know regarding their physical appearance or like skin tones especially or regarding their you know heights or like color race and i think uh, it it is still uh, in the uh, in the rural areas mostly if i'm talking to about nepal and then uh, for, for example some of the cities like kathmandu i believe the, i believe uh, those who are educated and who knows like uh, judgment doing the ju judgment on the basis of their physical appearance or you know uh, on basis of no matter how they want to look how they want to present themselves have been uh, reduced somehow since they know that judgment on basis of uh, any individual's life is not good so i think professor it has been reduced to somehow in cities uh, for example i guess i mean i won't say like to all the youths but i believe around me around my circles is it has been reduced to somehow and especially after coming to aw we have learned that judgment on basis of anything has not a student be there so i think especially to aw students uh, they no matter what they want to look like there has been less judgment that's all professor thank you yeah okay i actually you know i didn't really think a lot about this stuff when i came to the school but i think a lot of girls at AUW, when they're within the walls of the school, they dress in ways they would never dress uh, outside of the school, like they feel more free. Um, but what I also, I think somebody mentioned this and I was gonna ask, and again, we have to make sure people who haven't talked, talk. And so on the next round, if you want it, when I, when I, start on the next issue of uh, women in business. If you want to make a leftover comment from this, that's fine. Um, but let's just keep pressing forward. Um, here's the question. Does, it, for your friends that go to other universities, do they still talk? Do they still judge? I mean, maybe, they don't let girls know, but you don't know, you know, if college educated students also still judge on the basis of appearance. Um, among philosophy professors, I mean, you would think they're above that, but then you find out, you know, they aren't always above that. And lots of times, there will, um, they won't admit it, right? They can easily hide it, just talk to their friends, but they're not taking it out of their psyche. They're not living an examined life. They're just proceeding like they're just little adolescent boys, but they're smart and so they can do the academic thing and get successful. And then they aren't emotionally mature just like Apollo, you remember Apollo? He was the god of reason, but he chased nymphs. You know, he still objectified women, infantilized women, wanted to have sex with women he had no respect for. So the question is, you know, are there plenty of those Apollonian type guys around on university campuses, which I would imagine, yes which again explains why AUW is a really nice place for girls to be because they don't have to think about it and they shouldn't think about it. Like there's social pressure for them not to worry about what they look like, right? And just start thinking and living and enjoying your life and being passionate and figuring out what it is you're really passionate about without having to please somebody else in what you, you know, what major you go into or what you look like, what you wear, what you have in terms of money. I, you know, there might be a lot of other things wrong about AUW, but I think the climate on campus compared to almost any other place 
people could be is um, that was one of the major things I'm sure in any proposal that would be a major factor in why it gets funded. Um, anyway, I talk too much. Um, Amina, how about how about you? Officer, I'm thinking I didn't, I couldn't find anything. Okay, so you're gonna pass at the moment. Okay, Rahima. Yes, Professor, I have one example. I don't know how much so you make it. This is like uh, uh, the period uh, stigma. Like uh, most of the girls uh, faces the issue of uh, abdominal pain during period. And most of the, like I have that problem of uh, having a bad abdominal pain during my period days. So most of the, my relatives suggest that you should get married early because otherwise you can't be a mother anymore. Like uh, their first suggestion is that if you get married, everything will be okay. I don't know how my abdominal pain is related to my marriage, but they always give me these suggestions. What was it about your period? I lost it. I lost. Um, I got a bad uh, abdominal pain, like a uh, pain and like a uh, dizziness. Oh, yeah, and bad cramps. Vomiting. So you get bad cramps at your period? Yes, ma'am, always. Okay. I have so, to get medicines. So people tell you you should get married and somehow you're not yes. going to have cramps? <laughs> <laughs> uh forget it just don't do it rahima okay <laughs> never man yeah sorry um so trina what about you uh, trine are you there okay uh, Jennifer? Okay, Roshani, you'll have your turn in just a sec. Um, Jennifer, are you there? Still not there. Okay, go ahead, Jennifer. Jennifer, her microphone. Uh, yeah, you can write it in and I'll go on to the other students right now and then we'll go and read the stuff later, that's fine. Uh, Roshani, can you speak? Professor? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Do you just say my name? <laughs> okay. Um, so I was just reacting to the like uh, students who were uh, saying something, and I was just reacting to their thing. By the way, I also have like similar stories, or not just a story, but the similar thing that is happening to my society or my place. Actually, I'm in my village now, so um, I'm sorry if my internet is weak and if I'm not audible properly, <laughs> because the internet is really, really very poor, professor. Okay, so other than that, yeah, even we all feel the judgment thing. And just yesterday, there were my relatives visiting my house, and they were like, "Okay, she is now going to graduate. We need to find her, uh, like you know, boy. He is doing this. He he has a house there, something like that." And I was feeling so, um, you know, I was laughing at the same time, and I was like, "Why?" <laughs> and uh, even I was reacting. Uh, you know, even I was uh, being angry sometimes. So that was the thing. And professor, regarding the appearance thing, um, I I used to feel so bad initially because uh, since I have a dark, uh, not dark, yeah, dark skin color, but uh, people used to, you know, say me like, uh, used to call something uh, typical um, Nepali with some typical Nepalese name. Uh, and uh, I used to feel bad at when I was uh, young, uh, I mean, when I was a child, but then uh, when I grew up slowly, I realized that uh, if that's my color, then why shouldn't I be proud of that, right? So after that, I feel like it's my blessings. 
uh, if I have this color like uh, brown, brown skin, if I have my brown skin, then that should be my, um, like I should be happy with what I have because I, my body is physical, my whole physical body is good. Like I have a proper functioning of a body. Like I don't have any defects. So like, why should I be sad or why should I be uh, like depressed when somebody calls me like brown face or brown something like that. So uh, later on, um, I made it like I made my weakness to strength and some when, whenever anybody calls me something like okay you have a brown face oh you are not uh, you're not pretty or something I feel like okay yeah I'm not but uh, I'm I feel like I take it as a compliment even though they say it I take it as a compliment so I don't like really mind what they say so that's something like plus point that I have so I think um, people judge uh, no uh, it, like many people judge but we should accept what we have. Like if we are not able to accept uh, what we have, then then like I think we always feel bad because we should stop judging ourselves, right? We should stop uh, blaming ourselves or we should uh, stop cursing ourselves. Like why I have this or why I don't have a face or body like that or like them. So uh, we should accept ourselves and then everyone will eventually accept. <laughs> so that's what I think. And that's the story that I had, like my personal feelings. Yeah, well, I mean, a lot of money is made by women's insecurities. So you make them insecure and then you sell them stuff. And then you blame them for spending money. And then you True. overcharge for pads. And then you blame them. I mean, you have to realize, you know, the deck is stacked, but... I'll say this one more thing. And then again, I have to move first to the people who haven't spoken yet. This is the advantage of being the teacher is that I get to talk. Um, so I want you all to remember this. The next time somebody criticizes you for your brown skin, you tell them, I have a professor from the US and she has really light skin and she's so jealous of me because I have better skin. <laughs> Go ahead. Sure. I mean, it's true. It's absolutely true. You just tell them she knows that white skin is inferior skin. And it, you know, it evolved from people. I have my relatives in Sweden and England. They didn't have enough sun, right? So that's why their skin is, but they're not resilient. And especially not during uh, climate change. They're, they're all going to get skin cancer. So I'm not going to put this lotion on me and get skin cancer when all the white skin people are also getting skin cancer. Like, let's, let's stop. Then the other thing I want you to think about, if somebody tells you you're too fat or you're too thin or you're too just also they tell you you're too smart, right? They'll treat you like being smart is a problem. We have to get you married. And so you have to respond the same way. Like, if somebody thinks it's a weakness, it's your strength, right? That shouldn't be difficult. So the, your skin color is your strength. Your intelligence is your strength. Your weight is your own business. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and then um, that's it. Just use these things to get stronger. You can't ignore them. Just teach yourself to have the opposite button go on than the one that they want to trigger, right? Because it's looking for a trigger reaction, so you'll buy something. So you have to just create your own trigger, right? You can't ignore it or repress it. So then you can deliberately reform it, turn it around. Um, okay, so Habiba, what have you got? Are you there, Habiba? Okay. So we still haven't heard from Habiba, uh, Trine. Again, I think I'm torturing her name. Um, Jacinta, Janifa, um, Amina. Does any, any one of those want to speak in the microphone? And then I'll see what they've said, you know, on the chat, if they can't. Well, everybody else could check the chant, chat, I guess. Um, Professor, I think we had two hands raised. 
Okay, yeah, I know, but those, um, one of, let's see, Janifa, oh, Janifa hasn't spoken yet, but then, uh, you know, it didn't come through when I called on her. And so I will, um, I will call again. Let me just a second. Yeah, Marzia. <laughs> I understand why you're mad, Marzia. Um, let's see. Okay, so Janifa, are you there? Can you speak? Okay. Um, can okay. I speak? Yes. Uh, thank you. Like, I want to say one thing uh, about women. It's that uh, now uh, some parents, uh, I saw one of the parents, uh, they make her, uh, her like uh, their daughter, educated and also intelligent and everything is perfect in her life. And then because of that, uh, they want to sell uh, that girl. Uh, because uh, they need money. Uh, they said that since uh, she born, uh, we were caring, so we should sell her. Then they sell to, uh, they sell, uh, the, her parents sell to her, like with the, with the, uh, with very demands, like, and maybe, and also, and always uh, her parents care uh, her because of only to sell. I mean, does she like sell? She I mean, are you selling to a husband? Are you selling to a sex trade? Yeah. They don't care that uh, uh, they're selling to husband or they're selling to a servant as a servant. They don't care that. But that they are thought what that's that uh, they have to sell that girl. Um, I mean, do they know about sex trafficking? Uh, yes, ma'am. And they would be willing to sell her to that? Yes, ma'am. Uh, they said also that uh, they are go the girls also agree that uh, my, my parents are caring me since I born. So I have to I have to give something to them. And also the girls is like that. OK, yeah. Yes, OK, thank you. Thanks, Amina. OK, so Janifa says one of her cousins. Let's see, one of my cousin's sister had this experience. My cousin is a little bit short and has brown skin tone, but their family members are all taller. Every day, her mother forces her to continue to use expensive business products, go to the gym. Um, so this all comes from our family. Um, yeah, okay. So that's, yeah, not good. Um, yeah, you have to learn how to psychologically fight back, right? I mean, you can get angry if you want, but I think the most important thing is to is to rewire your mind and become resilient. That's why I'm a philosopher, right? I, you know, there's only, I. It, it's very important, obviously, to try to change the world. And there's so many women that you mentioned, women in the public eye, those are the women who actually have change. But I always thought about, well, you can always change your mind. You can always, no matter what the world does to you, you, can, you it shouldn't take your mind. Don't let it take your mind from you. That's kind of my starting point, because again, I'm Hestia, and we'll get to Hestia later on, but it's a very Hestia um, kind of reaction. Um, but uh, each of you will find your own way, right? Some of you will speak out, be angry, and be better off. That's a more natural response. Some of you, for me, anger just makes me depressed. <laughs> but really, the main point is not to let it get to you. That's really important. Um, and remember, it's tied to money, right? You're getting used for money, and then that is also getting used for a lot of other things. But at the end of the day, that is a big factor. So the next article was another student paper, um, and it was about women in business. And it's also this paper was an example of the next paper I want you to write. Um, I. Uh, 
which goddess do you admire the most? Which one fits your personality the most? Um, and she says an Athena archety archetype tends to defend the patriarchy. Likewise, the women in business in many situations, right, um, defend patriarchy. And that would be where women make money by selling these um, skin whitening products, right? That would be a typical case of an Athena. Um, and, you know, just so you're aware of it, just so it doesn't throw you off when you run into it, you probably will. And then another thing is that I think the biggest advantage of being smart and motivated and going to a good college is that you don't get in, stuck in a situation where you really have to do that to survive. Or you might have to do something you don't like for a while as a career stepping stone. But I think if you go to this college, you do well, you keep moving forward, you won't, ultimately most of your adult career life, you can do something that you believe in. But that you have to take a lot of effort about that. There's lots of ways people get stuck in situations they don't necessarily want to be in, but they have families to provide for, or they just, you know, there aren't as many options. Right now, you know, you have the world in front of you, you can envision having options and you just have to think about which options, if you, if there weren't other obstacles that you would uh, prefer. Hopefully there will be a day, right? When power and stratification economic would not matter um, as much and genders get equal, she says. And she wanted to give an example of a very successful woman. So in Bangladesh, I don't know how many of you know um, this, this woman who became a billionaire. Um, uh, okay, so women in Bangladesh, because of Brock, they are, they've got this whole micro lending tradition. Um, the micro businesses run from the home is a big Brock thing and solopreneurs. Um, and she herself said, and I think this should be a separate paragraph. I think I, my idea of paragraphs is a lot shorter than what most of you what you do on your posts. I don't know what other teachers do, but um, I prefer <laughs> shorter paragraphs. So she's, uh, she's talking about that in general in my country. And then there's another paragraph here. From a very young age, I was determined to work hard and become independent. So that's, you know, this determination came from witness, witnessing housewives around me quarreling with their money-making husbands over expenses, right? So she decided she hates the idea of being dependent on her husband for money and, and having him be able to completely control her, right? So her big thing is, I want to go into business, right? Which is fine. Uh, it's just... And she also wants, obviously, to go into a decent business, not a skin whitening business. But um, the, the, that is really important for her, being economically independent. Um, and there are a lot of women starting businesses. Now, these, um, these statistics about women-owned businesses, they really are deceptive because they're a huge percentage, right? 40% of firms uh, employ, uh, are women of color account for 64% of startups. Well, okay, <laughs> but startups are tiny, right? This is the woman who, who started a consignment shop where I used to go buy clothes because I never buy new clothes. And I don't buy a lot of clothes, but when I do, I go to a consignment shop, right? So these tiny little shops with like two women, uh, 
that's there's a lot of them and so they count as this huge percent but i mean jeff bezos <laughs> runs one company which probably accounts for uh i don't know how many million people work for amazon but maybe half <laughs> of the number of women who you know are running businesses so those statistics are a little are very deceptive but they do mean there's a lot of women who are independent and they do run businesses to the point where they can be economically independent and that can be a big deal and that can change their lives. But this doesn't mean that women are running 40% of our economy. <laughs> no way, Jose. Okay, so um, she says, okay, here's another thing that I'm asking you to do in your paper is that, yes, Athena is going to be my main one, but there's also Aphrodite and Demeter. Why? Because Demeter is that uh, the Demeter archetype is obsessed with her child. So a woman entrepreneur would treat her business as if it's her child, right? And protect it and enhance it. <laughs> and I'm sure some of them do, maybe all of them do. <coughs> okay, and then Aphrodite, when we read Aphrodite, you will understand that she is not supposed to be the object of the male gaze, right? She isn't a sex object for men. She's actually a vision carrier. She's the one that inspires people to give birth, right? For men, it's to have sex, right? But for it's really when somebody has a muse, usually a woman is a man's muse, and it motivates him to write music or to write, you know, literature. And, and oftentimes, this is you know, um, so-and-so Mahler had this woman who was his muse, blah, blah. But uh, women should be the vision carrier for each other. And the Aphrodite qualities that a businesswoman would need would be that she needs to go and sell. She needs to have a really good public presence and be um, uh, inspiring other girls to be independent, but also, you know, inspiring people to buy her products. But uh, I know I had students that had Aphrodite um, the first time I taught it, and they did, a lot of them really were interested in getting young girls to pursue their own passions. And I think that's because the women who are primarily Aphrodite know how easily women can get forced into the mold of, okay, now you can attract a rich guy, you know? No, no, that's not what it's about. Loving beauty. Um, so there could be a lot of Aphrodite type business women who really like handcraft. They really like the arts. They like painting. They have all these skills they learned at home and they relate to love of beauty. And then they want to run a business and they want to sell it. But Aphrodite is, is definitely a role, plays a role. And then she talks about this very famous uh, woman in, born in Taiwan who is amazing. Like she's a billionaire and she really got in at the, the ground floor on technology. So that, that, that was a great story. That's why, I mean, when I teach, uh, at AUW, it's, I learned so much. Um, and then one quote from her, she lives a simple life. And her quote is, it takes humility to realize we don't know everything and not to rest on our laurels. We must keep learning and observing. If we don't, we can be sure some startup will be there. Okay. So that's Artemis, right? The competitive one. I'm going to keep winning. Um, but also her humility, her self-knowledge, that, that is really a great quote. Plus it's authentic, right? She didn't just say that to score points with somebody. Um, so, um, and then her last one is, if you have a vision, no matter how difficult things are, everything becomes a process. So again, 
by studying the goddesses, and I want you to help articulate your vision. And you might not get there this soon in your life, but you just get to where you you know that, that that's a question you need to be asking yourself constantly. What do I want, right? What do I want most? I still ask myself that almost every day. I, that's how I prioritize things. Um, and even something, you know, that was my great passion 40, 35 years ago, some days just seems really awful. I don't like it at all. <laughs> and I, so, I mean, it's just constantly, what do you want? So, um, all right, guys. So I want you to think, you know, come with examples of business women you know that you admire. Um, that would be my number one. But on the other hand, on the other hand, you can have any reaction you want to to this paper. If there's some other aspect of the paper that sort of stood out in your mind. Um, so go ahead, um, Fayasa. Do you have a comment or an example? No, Professor. Okay, Mahira. Yes, Professor. Okay. Businesswoman in Bangladesh, uh, like, uh, you know, she's the president of Bangladesh Garments Manufacturers and Exports Association. She is Ruby Naho. She's, uh, she's a prominent and great businesswoman in our country. Does she, does she, is she a philanthropist also? Sorry, ma'am. Does she give money? Is she into philanthropy? She and her husband are both in that uh, the main uh, main post or big or bigger authorities in that association. Okay. Um, does she present herself as a role model and en encourage young women to go into business? I don't. Uh, I don't think she does that. She only just uh, runs the business, or no, she does not do like things like inspiring or or influencing girls to go that in business. But she, uh, she herself as a businesswoman, uh, runs that. Okay. Um, so again, if you if you do a little more research on these people, like um, uh, Safia did. You can see which ones are competitive and which ones aren't, which ones are more, they loved handcrafts and they just went into a business because they loved, they, they want to sell people something that the people would love as much as they loved the handcrafts. Um, other ones are more motherly toward their business. Other ones are more, you know, um, whatever. Anyway, you can bring in those other goddesses and see what kind of a businesswoman, how she combines the different passions that women have. Um, okay, um, Jacinta. Are you there? Okay, Toma. Ma'am, actually in this moment, I didn't find a new man like this, but I'm trying to find. Okay, Marzia, and you can, Marzia, you can also comment on what you wanted to say before. That's fine. Uh, professor, for the previous uh, text, I have Okay, okay, you, you, you sound kind of muted. Okay, try again. And now, That's am I audible? Okay. Uh, about the previous passage, I just want because everyone say that, that people mean women fair, Islamy. So I just wanted to ask that those men who wants women like this are they good enough? Do they like? Do they look back to themselves? So just like it's. Uh, yeah, I should not be angry, maybe, but it's for me, it's not standable. 
that why they look at women as a, as a thing, not as a human, not as a person. Because it's women, it's every individual's lives matter that how they want to look, how their skin is, any way they are, they are beautiful, but it doesn't matter. And about this passage uh, and about the women in business, I wanna say that uh, it's still women in business face lots of problem. Because, because if even their family believe in them, the society do not believe that a woman can be independent. Uh, the society doesn't believe that a woman can run uh, her own, uh, for example, her own business. Uh, in, in my country, like right now, I can say that it's totally different from two months ago. Uh, right now, even, even girls doesn't have a choice to go to school because it's men who decide for them. Not their, even not their men in family, just uh, some, some men who are governing the country. So I, I, I'm really speech, speechless about all the things that happens to women. And what makes me so sad is that we can't do anything. Yeah, and that story of dancing in the mosque, um, it was just pretty much overnight that the Taliban took over and everything changed. Um, yes, Professor, the things which is sad is that the history repeated again. Yeah, and then Malala, her story, a lot of you have read that Malala story, that again was I mean, they were aware that they were coming, but still, when it hits, it hits so hard and so quickly. Um, yeah, it's sad. Um, all right, Pooja? Pooja, are you there? Do you have an example of a woman business woman? No professor for now. Okay. Uh, Amina, did you do you have an example? Uh, no, ma'am. I don't think that in my community there is like business women, like the who do who do business women. I, I don't think so. Are there any in your country that are sort of famous in your country, right? Yes, but, uh, can you think of some like the previous person talked about Mahira talked about this pretty well known woman business woman um, in Bangladesh and I'm just wondering if in the back of your minds you know one right you have that archetype in the back of your mind maybe she was really smart like some of them are really, I think I showed you that video, the woman who started this genetic testing, you get your whole gene genome read. She was really good in science. And so she went forward and started a business. So there might be women like that in your countries. Um, maybe they were doctors and they thought of certain kind of devices or you know medicines or something. Um, uh, like, um, ma'am, I can say that, uh, like in in my country, like especially in my community society, like uh, women who who have who want to become a uh, like to do her own business, uh, she have to migrate to other country or to other uh, other village where no one know us. Ah, okay. Okay, what country are you from? You guys ought, ought to say. Yeah, I'm from Myanmar. So, uh, especially it's happening in in uh, Muslim community. So, not okay. other community. There are many religions there, so it's fine to others. Okay, so among the Buddhists, is it more acceptable for women to start businesses? Yes, professor, they do different kind of businesses. 
Okay. Do they do the micro businesses like women working at home and selling, you know, making handicrafts or making pottery or making clothing? Yes, Professor, somehow they did uh, those kind of things. Okay. So I know micro lending was really big in Bangladesh and that you just have to believe that every everybody in that area knows about that. Um, my daughter actually worked, worked for a micro lending company for a year. It was called Finca. Um, I don't even know if any of you've heard of it, but it was a great, you know, it's a great project. Um, Dolana, do you have something? No, Professor, right now I have no idea. Is there anything else you want to say? And I interrupted you last time earlier. Uh, Professor, can it be like something uh, a woman uh, established or uh, organizations uh, regards the support of, you know, uh, family or friends? Sure, it can be anything. <laughs> So I, I I know a woman uh, in in that way is like one of my uh, school's teacher. She used to be a single mother, and then when uh, her um, husband left her, so she moved to a new city, and she was uh, also a lawyer. So she established a uh, industry for women's right. Uh, I mean, like organizations for women's right, and it's doing very good. It's uh, a ruler based uh, organi organization, uh, like you know, a mother group, where they discuss about um, their rights, their reproductive health, and uh, you know, uh, the issues related to women. Uh, domestic violence and these things and they conduct a lot of program and it's doing very good and she was nominated recently for you know the province level uh, uh, you, know, you know for the government sectors uh, and yeah that's all about oh for talking to women in the garment industry about their rights uh, no, Professor, government level. Oh, so government. Okay. Government. Yes, Professor. Okay. That, yes, that yes. really sounds like Athena, right? Um, which is, it's great. It's just there is a difference between going into a social justice type career and going into money making, right? Um, although everybody does have to battle for rights all the way along. Uh, but anyway, that's fine. Let's see, Rahima, do you have something? Uh, Ma'am, currently I don't have an example, but uh, I can add to Amina's words, like as she said that in Muslim community, there is a tendency of uh, women not, uh, like women are not in business. But ma'am, I can say like, uh, Islam supports the most women to come in business because uh, you know, the prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam we follow, like he, uh, he was the man who was working under uh, a woman, uh, like in, in business, which, uh, who was Khadiza, and she, she become her first wife after, yeah. after that. So uh, I, I just want to add this, like, that's not like uh, every Muslim uh, community is like that. Yeah, I mean, obviously every religion has many branches so, I mean, the Taliban wouldn't let women start their own business, but Muhammad's first wife, right? That was a business relationship. Yeah. And so, yeah, it, I, you know, I assume you all know that because you know Islam well enough to know that it gets caught up in cultural things. I don't think any of those religions if you just look at the religion, which is I teach in my other class, if you just look at the religion, the spirituality is not material at all. It doesn't have genitals, you know? It's about your spirit, what you love. And so all of that gendered stuff is just 
not true to the religion. And, and the leaders of it, like Jesus, Buddha, and I think Muhammad, they were way ahead of their time and way less sexist. Maybe you could say not sexist at all, but way, way less sexist than the culture around them. So just an FYI, it's also true of Buddhism and Christianity and Hinduism. They're not inherently sexist, um, but they, they get you know, corrupted by the culture. Um, let's see, Janifa, do you have an example of a woman, somebody you know in business or someone in the public eye, maybe an organization, maybe, you know, a nonprofit, just anything that sort of is, is the focus is the profit motive, but hopefully women engage in it in a way that isn't just trying to be a rich guy. <laughs> Do you have anything, Jennifer? No, ma'am. Okay. What about Trin? I don't know. She doesn't seem to be there. Um, could you type something in, Trin, so that I know you're there? Um, and then if if not, you really need to contact me, you know, in your somewhere, some other context. Um, because I know that usually Trina is a good student, so I don't quite understand this, but um, who has not spoken yet that would like to speak about some, you know, women in the marketplace issue? Anybody? Um, can I? Yes, go ahead, Lucy. Yeah, so I know a woman. He, uh, she established a work organization uh, called Emotional Mental Health Organization. And she is the founder of this institution. So, uh, you know, uh, she provided, you know, mental counselor to people. And uh, uh, I also took part in her organization and uh, present our ideas. Also, she got uh, many awards for her organization. And I think, yeah, she win also, you know, Miss Bangladesh uh, contest, you know, beauty contest. So, yeah, she maybe. Okay. I mean, I really think that a certain number of AUW graduates will start organizations. I mean, not at age 20, yeah. but somewhere along the way. I think, I mean, you know, you don't have to if that's not your calling. But if it is, I think you should expect eventually by the time you're 40 that you will be able to do that if that's what's natural for you. And that's how you think you can make a great contribution. I myself can't imagine anything managerial. <laughs> I have to depend on other people to do the organizing. I just love the ideas. But um, most other people are not like that. So make sure you set your sights high. OK, then we had that one other article about whether uh, people will put up with a woman boss, right? Now, this is even in America, right? Would you rather work for a man or a woman? And, um, oh my gosh, it's almost time to go. Okay, well, just the punchline here is that even in the United States, which is supposed to be, you know, pretty egalitarian, people still don't like women bosses and they have a double standard. A man can be, you know, a good leader, a woman is bossy or bitchy. You know, it's the same. Hillary Clinton got so trashed for stuff because she was has been in this for so many decades. Um, 
anyway, so that's another thing for you to read. And then on your post, all I want you to do is, is let me know you read it, right? So you just have a couple sentence reaction to it. Um, this is disappointment, disappointing. Um, and then the next thing would be, you know, as a woman in a developing country, it might be more likely that the only way for you to really develop your skills as a businesswoman would be to start an organization or would be to work for an organization run by women who hire women, you know, that the chances of you being able to go through a sort of normal uh, getting hired by a company and getting mentored and getting up, you know, you need men all along the way who don't mind. And even American women, it was called the glass ceiling. They would get so high and then they would never get promoted after that. So that's just something to keep in mind. Okay, so for the next class, we have Hera. Um, I'm just reminding you that I did get two weeks ahead on the post, so you do have to scroll down a ways before you find the date. But Hera is the wife, and um, I have I'm reading a book by Melinda Gates, um, "How Empowering Women Changes the World," and um, I I don't know if you guys can get a hold of that book, um, but. It, it, I think it's a good way for you to become better writers because it's not a difficult read in English, but you're just constantly, you know, reading English that is very conversational, very accessible. It would be the kind of writing that you would want to do. So you're reading something that's on about the level that you would want to be writing on. And that's why I think in some of your other classes, you get much more difficult academic reading. Um, but I think, and then also social science doesn't really require you to, to keep your mind on an argument. It's a lot of number crunching, and it, it doesn't ask you to sort of focus over time. So I think books like this help you to focus, to see the parts and the whole, and not to get lost in the words and to just help you write better. So that would be my idea. I'm not gonna require it, but if you wanted to, if you can download it somehow, my students are much better at this than I am, and you have time, I think you'd be interested in it. Um, if I find a chapter particularly relevant, but that the issue for next time is Hera, the wife. And then we have these famous women who are famous because of their husbands. Melinda Gates, uh, Mackenzie um, Scott, who's uh, Jeff Bezos' ex-wife. Melinda Gates is now Bill Gates' ex-wife. But they are very much their own person. And um, But if you, you bring examples of women you know whose identities are caught up in being the wife of a powerful person, a wealthy person, a person with some status. And among your relatives, you know, the, the men might, they aren't the president of a company, but they might have some level of status, right? In the village or some in some context. And then the wife loves to play the role of the wife. And I don't know if she had social obligations Anyway, so you think of one that you know personally, and then one in the public eye in your country. Um, or if you can't think of your country, you can think of other ones. Um, and remember to tell us what country you're from. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry that I can't, I should have written it down a long time ago and I didn't. So um, I love to picture that. I love students from a lot of different places. Okay, it's 1041. Um, I will stop the recording and we will hear all about the Hera. I, and you'll find out I'm a terrible Hera. Hera, I don't get Hera. I don't get what wives are supposed to do. Whatever it was.